hour-long interview. She questioned the credibility uh, of two of the more serious allegations against Governor Cuomo, including from the woman who broke her silence today about her criminal complaint against Governor Cuomo, previously known only as Executive Assistant One, who says Cuomo reached into her shirt and groped her breast. Let's listen to that exchange. How is Executive Assistant One's account corroborated? It's corroborated because she saw the governor speaking and started crying when he said he didn't engage in inappropriate behavior. And so she told two other staffers at the time what happened, and that was in the report. And, and I didn't, by that, the way, this say... Was, th this was five months after she alleged this happened. Okay, so did and, that and, undermine and this her story, in your view? Does that undermine her story that she waited five months? What undermines her story is that there is absolutely no corroboration at the time no corroboration at the time. So my question to you, Ariva, does the fact that she confided in colleagues months later undercut the witness corroboration here? Not at all, Pamela. You know, what we heard from Governor Cuomo's attorney is the tired, pathetic, attack the witness approach that we've seen in so many of these high profile cases. They go after the witnesses, they, they try to malign their character, undermine their credibility. But what we know about executive assistant number one, we now know her name is Brittany, is that these investigators, independent investigators, have said in this 160 plus page report that she's credible, that her demeanor is credible, that the statements, the allegations that she made are also corroborated, as you pointed out in that interview, by other employees in the governor's office. So I, I didn't understand Rita's argument. I, I was really confused by her c constant comments about the governor not being involved in what she you know, deemed intentional conduct. He made slips. He didn't mean it. She knows, as a seasoned uh, labor and employment attorney, that the standard here is not his subjective feeling, but it, it's the reasonable person standard. What would a reasonable person know? And we're not talking about a low-level employee. We're talking about the highest-ranking elected official in the state of New York. We're talking about someone that should have participated in hours and hours of sexual harassment training, who has passed laws about sexual harassment. So Governor Cuomo absolutely had an understanding that his conduct was inappropriate, yet he continued to engage in it. So for now, his lawyer to suggest somehow he, he didn't do it intentionally and, and he made slips, it's really offensive to those women and it's offensive to the, the work that has been done over the last two or three years to bring these issues of sexual harassment forward and finally to get victims like Brittany believed by the public. So you mentioned this, the defense being that he just slips at times. I mean, that is what she said. I followed up on that as you heard. That is basically what she is saying, that it wasn't intentional. How much of a defense is that? It's a zero defense. There, <laughs> there's no defense about I didn't know, particularly when we're dealing with the highest ranking person in that office. And as, as you know, someone like Governor Cuomo has had to participate in, in so many conversations with HR professionals with labor and employment attorneys. Uh, he's probably designed or been a part of, of designs of sexual har harassment training for his entire staff. He knows what inappropriate conduct is. And it's not enough to say, uh, you know, I I'm from a different era. We are in an era where everyone knows where the lines are, what the standards are. We've lived through Bill Cosby, Harvey Weinstein, so many high profile men uh, who've had allegations against them that have been substantiated. And so this notion that we're somehow, you know, in the dark ages 20, 25 years ago. It's just a, an incredible argument, I think, to be making by the government governor. And I think it just shows he does not have a substantive, credible defense to these allegations. But I, I do want to bring up what her argument is about the report itself, right? There are two issues. There is the report, um, and there's also the allegations that were made. She says that this report has several key omissions um, she'd heard that, she, that from other attorneys of what their clients had said that wasn't included in the report. We still haven't seen, she hasn't seen the underlying evidence, the transcripts. Do you see that as problematic? If what uh, Rita has said is, is correct and that there are omissions of people who made statements favorable to the governor, yes, that is problematic. And doing these kinds of investigations, and I've been involved in them, you should include all of the information that, that has been presented during the investigation. So if witnesses came forward and said that uh, statements that some of these 11 women have made you know, is incredible or that these women had some ulterior motive, 
then yes, that information should have been included. But what we didn't hear the governor's lawyer do is attack the credibility of the claims made by the 11 women that have come forward. She spent a lot of time talking about two, uh, Bennett and Boylan. And you know she wouldn't say much about the state tro uh, the, the trooper that was involved, but there are nine other women. So to suggest that the 20% of these claims may have some credibility issues, okay, what about the other nine? We haven't heard hardly any mention of those allegations. But yeah, she has every right to raise questions about you know the, the thoroughness and the complete, completeness of this report. And if it lacks in some areas, then absolutely, let's get that evidence out. And you mentioned the state trooper. Listen to this back and forth about the touching of the state trooper, what she was willing to say. That's not criminal conduct, as far as I know. Okay, so if he did that, is that acceptable behavior? Depends on what the context of the circumstances were. Depends on the context. Okay, so I just want to be clear because the governor has completely has said he hasn't done anything inappropriate. Are you saying it depends on if it was consensual or not? Is that what you're getting at? No, no. What I'm what okay. I'm getting at what I'm getting at, Pamela, is that the governor may very well have touched the state trooper's back, and she may have understood it one way, and he understood it another way. So I, I asked, you know, how is that appropriate? What was your reaction to her response? That was an idiotic response. Uh, let's, <laughs> let's, let's set the stage here, Pamela. You work for the governor, the highest ranking official in the state of New York, the power dynamic that exists between an employee and their supervisor, and not just any supervisor, the governor. And he touches your back. Under what circumstances would it ever be appropriate? Maybe there's a fire on the elevator and he's trying to rescue her. He's trying to save her. So, yes, there are some circumstances under which your supervisor can touch your back. That didn't happen in this case. This lawyer knows that didn't happen in this case. This state trooper would not have come forward and made these allegations if this was some casual touch. And I should, you know, I want to make this point. When you're dealing with sexual harassment, you're talking about severe and pervasive conduct. You're not talking about a stray comment or a casual remark that's made by someone. This conduct has to be so severe and pervasive that it changed the nature of this work environment. It made the work environment hostile. It changed the conditions of employment for these employees. So we're not talking about, again, a casual touch that might happen because, you know, maybe the elevator skipped the floor. This is intentional conduct on the part of the governor that was unwelcome and un, you know, warrant, un, you know, unsolicited uh, by these women, and, and the lawyer knows that. They said, yeah, unwanted touching. All right, Ariva Martin, thank you so much for offering uh, your legal analysis on this. Thanks, Pamela. Well, the first wave of American